for our second uh, presentation today. Um, the topic is looking at ethical considerations regarding the barriers and solutions to accessing healthcare services in rural areas and populations. We have uh, two presenters um, with us who are going to um, who are going to talk about this topic. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Diane Hall. Dr. Diane Hall currently serves as a senior scientist for policy and strategy in the policy research, analysis, and development office here at here at CDC. That's within the office of the associate director for policy and strategy. Dr. Hall leads the office work on translating science for policy use, policy research and analysis, and developing policy relevant training. Dr. Hall also serves as CDC's coordinator and point of contact for rural health work. Dr. Hall led the development of the office's policy portal, the policy analysis and research information system. And following her presentation will be Ms. Kathy Kinlaw. Ms. K Ms. Kinlaw currently serves as the Associate Director of the Associate Director for the Center for Ethics, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Emory University, and Director of the Healthcare Ethics Consortium. She serves as Chair at Emory University Hospital Ethics Committee, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Emory School of Medicine, and Director of the Healthcare Ethics Consortium, a network of healthcare systems in the Southeast. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hall and Ms. Kathy Kinlaw. Dr. Hall, thank you. Thank you, Craig, and thanks to the committee for the invitation to present today. As Craig mentioned, my name is Diane Hall, and I'm a senior scientist working in CDC's Policy and Strategy Office, but it is also my privilege to serve as CDC's point of contact and lead for coordinating our rural health work. Today, I'll be talking with you about rural access to healthcare services, and I will be focusing on rural in the US, not global rural. So uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so I'd like to talk about rural populations. Next slide. Oh, Diane, you have control of the screen, so you can move it if you please. Really? Yes. You accept control and you can move it forward. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to start with um, a definition of uh, rural. As uh, Dr. Knudsen said uh, at the top of uh, this session, there isn't one definition. As a matter of fact, there are over 70 that the U.S. government uses. Um, but I'll be using the 2013 National Center for Health Statistics Urban Rural Classification Scheme for Counties, which is based on the Office of Management and Budgets 2013 county-based classification system. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner of this map, you'll see a legend. Non-metropolitan is often considered a proxy for rural areas, and those would be the green areas. And those represent micropolitan and non-core. So micropolitan um, is an area that has a population between 10,000 and 50,000 residents and non-core are counties that lie outside metropolitan statistical areas. I'm going to talk about rural and non-rural for the most part, um, mostly because definitions of rural are usually whatever's left over after you've defined your metropolitan and your urban areas. So as you can see by all the green on this map, there are 46 million individuals or about 15% of the population distributed across a very large geographic area in pretty much every state. The metropolitan areas or the urban areas are designated by the four remaining colors. Okay, so in 2017, CDC published a rural health series of morbidity and mortality weekly reports, or MMWRs. The first report in that series showed that the percentage of people dying was higher in rural counties than in non-rural counties across the five leading causes of death. 
In November 2019, CDC published an MMWR on causes of death by rurality, breaking out the counties using those six levels in that NCHS classification. So as you can see from this graph, if you focus on the two darker brown colors, we see that rates are higher in the most rural areas. That 2019, the November 2019 MMWR also showed trends over time. And as you can see here, the percentages of potentially excess deaths from the five leading causes were higher in the most rural counties compared to the most urban. And I've indicated those with those red arrows. This MMWR update also included comparisons by different levels of rurality, by region, and by state. So I encourage you to take a look at it. You can also see that there are gaps between the most rural to the most urban counties, and you can see them over time. So the gap increased between the most rural and the most urban for cancer, heart disease, and chronic lower respiratory disease. Stroke remained relatively stable. The gap decreased for unintentional injury, which includes poisonings or overdoses, falls, and motor vehicle collisions, because non-rural is getting worse, and that's not the way you want to close a gap. So thinking a little bit about populations and the folks that live in rural areas, a lot of times people say that rural populations are older, poorer, and sicker. This graph shows the continuing gap in the poverty rate looking at metro and non-metro areas. While things have improved since 1959, the gap has been persistent for decades. In addition, when we look at different geographic regions, race, ethnicity, family household type, or age groupings, the rural poverty rate is consistently higher than the non-rural rate. And when we look at geographic region, this probably won't be surprising, but the rural non-rural gap is largest in the South. When we look at race ethnicity, the gap is largest for American Indian, Native Alaskan, and Black African American. For family household type, the largest gaps are for female headed households. And finally, when we look by age group, the largest rural non-rural gap is for children under five years of age. I'd also like to point out two reports that examine what might be behind the mortality rate differences we see. This first article was published in Health Affairs in December 2019 in a special issue focused on rural health. The researchers specific, specifically looked at poverty, access to physicians, and health insurance. Looking at state-level data, the researchers found that rural mortality was higher than non-rural mortality in all states except for three, Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming. The largest differences between rural and non-rural were in Virginia, Florida, and California. But there was quite a bit of variation with rates differing across states by as much as 69%. The authors looked at five explanatory variables, rural, non-rural residents, well-being index, primary care physician access, the percentage of uninsured residents, and the percent of racial and ethnic minority groups in that area. They found that larger rural mortality rates could be largely explained by three factors, socioeconomic deprivation, which came from the wellness index, physician shortages, and lack of health insurance. And of those three, socioeconomic deprivation was most closely linked to higher mortality in rural areas. So it's not just living in a rural area in and of itself that affects mortality. The second report is an MMWR published in February of 2017 as part of that series, and it looked at health behaviors as reported in the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFSS. The researchers looked at five health behaviors, getting sufficient sleep, non-smoking, non-drinking or moderate drinking, maintaining a normal body weight, and meeting aerobic leisure time physical activity recommendations. And adults living in the rural areas, non-metro, did not differ in terms of sufficient sleep or non-drinking or moderate drinking, but they had lower prevalence of non-smoking, meaning they were smoking more, lower prevalence of maintaining a normal body weight, and lower prevalence of meeting aerobic leisure time physical activity recommendations. 
Now that I've provided a brief overview of the health of rural populations, I'd like to talk more specifically about health services and access issues. I'm going to call these services health services. I'm borrowing language directly from healthy people, but I will use health services and healthcare services interchangeably. So this was mentioned previously, and hopefully this graphic or something similar is familiar to many, if not most of you. It is important to keep in mind that what makes and keeps us healthy is about many factors. It is not just about seeing a physician. Healthcare services provide treatment to address illness and injury. A lot of times when we talk about health in this country, we shift almost immediately to talking about healthcare. And as was previously noted, those are not the same things. Both are important, but they are not the same. Today, I'm talking about healthcare and access in rural communities. So let's start with why access to health services is so important. Some of the reasons are listed on the slide and I'm not going to read them to you, but none of them should be surprising. A person's ability to access health services can affect every aspect of his or her health. Yet many people do not have a primary care provider or even a center where they can receive regular medical services. In many rural communities, there are barriers to being able to access health services. There are several listed here, but I will go into detail for only a couple of them. The first is distances. So in 2018, Pew Research published a policy brief that showed that rural residents live an average of 10.5 miles from the nearest hospital compared to 5.6 for suburban and 4.4 for urban. Again, this is an average. This map shows the average car travel time to the nearest hospital. However, it's important to note that the ranges in time vary greatly. For rural residents, Pew found that the range was 5.8 to 34 minutes. For suburban, it was 5.2 to 21 minutes. And for urban, it was 4.5 to 18.7 minutes. This might not seem like a significant amount of time, but imagine if there is an emergency. Or imagine that you need to have some sort of routine screening and you have to take time out of your day to go and get that screening. Since 2005, there have been 174 rural hospital closures. However, 132 of these have been since 2010. In fact, as I was putting together the slides for this talk, another hospital closed and I had to update the map. This map shows the hospitals that have closed. However, the National Rural Health Association estimates that another 700 are at risk of closing. Most of the closures are in the South, 60%. And in the South, we see that poverty rates are higher and people are generally less healthy and less likely to have insurance, either public or private insurance. Most of these hospitals close because of financial problems. And according to the Shep Center, which does this research, 38% of rural hospitals are not profitable. However, it is important to note that rural hospitals, in addition to providing healthcare, are also one of the largest, if not the largest, employer in a community. And a typical rural hospital employs about 300 people. Research out of the University of Minnesota shows that between 2004 and 2014, 179 rural counties lost all hospital-based obstetric services. If a person doesn't have health insurance, they're less likely to have a regular source of medical care and are more likely to skip routine care because of costs. This can increase the person's risk for serious health conditions. We often hear about people waiting to seek care because of cost, which can mean that their condition can worsen. We also know that delays in seeking care for serious illness or injury can have serious and even tragic consequences. According to a report by the US Census Bureau in 2018, 9.1% of people living in rural areas did not have any health insurance compared to 8.4% for non-rural areas. And if people in rural areas did have insurance, it was much more likely to be public insurance such as Medicaid. And there is a challenge because there is a limited supply of rural healthcare providers who offer low cost care or accept Medicaid. A 2018 policy brief by the Rupri Center for Rural Health Policy Analysis reported that insurance premiums are higher in rural areas and rural counties are more likely to only have one insurance issuer participating in the health insurance marketplace in that area. 
This issue of insurance market challenge is a topic of a 2018 policy brief that was issued by the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services. A 2016 report from HHS found that 26.5% of rural residents delayed or did not receive care due to costs in the previous 12 months. This rate was also similar to non-rural residents who were not insured. This map shows areas that have been designated health professional shortage areas or HIPSA, and this is for 2019. The darkest blue indicates that the entire county has been designated a shortage area. And look where the darkest blue counties are. I also want to note that this map is only for primary care. It is much worse for obstetrical care, oral care, mental health care, substance abuse treatment, hospice, and palliative care. Federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, were mentioned in the previous panel, and so I do want to point out that there are safety net clinics that serve rural areas. FQHCs are part of the rural health care safety net. Note that FQHCs also serve non-rural communities. Rural communities also have access to Indian Health Service and tribal clinics that are part of that rural safety net. And rural health clinics are another part of the safety net. They serve rural areas, and this map shows where those rural health clinics are located. So that was a lot of doom and gloom. Um, so what are the programs and activities that are attempting to address some of these issues? Okay, so this is actually a picture of Tinker Mountain in southwestern Virginia where I went to college and it's one of my favorite areas. Um, my son took that photo a couple of years ago. Um, so this slide shows some of the programs and activities um, that are working to address healthcare issues in rural communities. The first is the National Health Service Corps and I saw something in the previous session in the chat with some information about it. The National Health Service Corps awards scholarships and loan repayment to students and qualified primary health care professionals who agree to work in areas that have limited access to health care, those HIPSA areas. Recruitment and retention of physicians in rural areas can be challenging. That was also mentioned in the previous discussion. Many communities recruit non-US citizen international medical graduates who have trained on a J-1 visa. Essentially, international med medical graduates have up to seven years to complete their medical training before returning to their home country. They are required to spend two years in their home country before they can apply for permanent residence or an H-1B visa. This waiver waives the two-year home country residency requirement, allowing the physician to stay in the U.S. to practice in a healthcare professional shortage area. There are also medical schools that specifically train students to become rural providers. Mercer University in Georgia is one example. Their website states, the School of Medicine educates physicians and health professionals to meet the primary care and healthcare needs of rural and medically underserved areas of Georgia. In addition, in 2019, the American Academy of Family Physicians, AAFP, launched their Rural Health Initiative. This not coincidentally, was when Dr. John Cullen was president. Dr. Cullen is a family physician practicing in Alaska. There are also efforts to assist facilities. The first is critical access hospital designation, which is also previously mentioned. Essentially, this designation is designed to reduce the financial vulnerability of rural hospitals and improve access to care in rural areas, essentially keeping those critical services available in the community. CAH designation carries benefits such as cost-based reimbursement for Medicare services. There are spe specific requirements and facilities need to apply and be approved for that designation. During the um, COVID-19 pandemic, the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act of April 2020 provided $225 million to rural health clinics for COVID-19 testing. These funds are managed through HRSA and funding went to 4,549 rural health clinics. And finally, telehealth is a way to increase access to services. I will not say a lot about it because it's covered in so many areas and it is a complex issue and I don't have the time to cover all of those issues. But I do wanna note that telehealth is a tool. It's not a cure for access issues. 
There are many barriers to telehealth, such as broadband access, reimbursement issues, and licensure challenges. The pandemic has called increased attention to the issue of telehealth, so maybe some of these barriers will be addressed sooner rather than later. CDC has two different um, websites that put together a lot of our rural health information. The URLs are listed there. You can also email ruralhealth.cdc.gov if you have any question about the rural work that we do. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time today, and I would like to turn it over to Kathy Kinlaw, Associate Director of Emory Center for Ethics and the Program Director, Ethical Engagement in Health and Science. Thank you very much. I'm not sure why you're not seeing me, but I'll proceed with my uh, slides if they can be put up, please. Can you hear me? Yes, Kathy, we can hear you. Okay. You might have control of the slides like I did and didn't realize it. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. So um, as I've been introduced, I'm an ethicist uh, working at Emory University. And that's sort of the perspective I want to start bringing in here. And because I know we have limited time, I will probably stay close to that and flip by a few of the slides that um, may affirm some of the things that Dr. Hall just indicated and then want to get to some opportunity for, for discussion with you. So first of all, again, thank you to CDC and the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee University for the opportunity to participate. So I want to make sure we've at least sort of paused long enough to think about what we mean by access to care. And so I'll go back to the Institute of Medicine uh, 1993 definition, having timely use of personal health services to achieve the best possible health outcome. And I think this still stands the test of time, if you will. I think I went forward one, one too many, maybe. Let's see. Okay, there are components to access to healthcare services that I think are important and hope that we can talk about. Certainly, insurance coverage in general makes entry into healthcare systems easier. Um, and without it, people are less likely to seek care. That's true, of course, um, as Dr. Warren has said, in, in urban as well as non urban areas but insurance coverage is uh, diminished in many rural areas. It also requires that healthcare services be available, hopefully where a provider relationship is established and so one can you know, regularly receive care and receive importantly primary and preventive services, not just treatment for tertiary services. Care needs to be timely, so readily accessible after you know, a need is recognized by the individual and really importantly, it requires that there be, you know, qualified, culturally thoughtful, and that their competent, competency is really a, the right term, but culturally um, humble and um, listening uh, members of healthcare teams. So cultural humility, where we can develop some aspect of trust in working with our providers. So public health ethics um, as a discipline is really a systematic process that tries to clarify and prioritize and justify what are the courses of public health action um, that we should be moving forward. And they're based on ethical principles and values and beliefs um, of stakeholders, scientifically available evidence um, and other information. And this is the CDC definition that you see. So I want to focus for a moment on the power of what it means to be attentive to public health in the ways that you all are, and that is in safeguarding the public's health. So that's a core commitment, of course, and in saying this, each person's welfare and, and the whole community as a whole really um, are important. So they, they matter, it matters to support each person and to support them in what I would call their flourishing or their well-being. So what opportunities exist? Um, and where do individuals have capabilities that are supported? Capabilities for making your own decision, 
for being creative, for having enough information and understanding to, to participate fully in decision making, and essentially for living one's potential you know, fully. I think that's a powerful part of um, what we should be thinking about in terms of values and principles in public health ethics. So there are a number of principles, if you, um, those of you who are working in the discipline know, that are important. Um, certainly, we talk a lot about maximizing benefit and minimizing harms. And we're thinking about that, not just, of course, for individual patients, but for communities as a whole. Um, I will say that that um, articulation of a principle is sometimes called utilitarian ethics, or the greatest good for the greatest number. So I think we have to um, constrain that understanding a bit by thinking about um, who else uh, is, is going to be cared for as we make those decisions. So it's not a matter of just the good of the whole being maximized because that can leave out segments of our population. So there's some constraints on the idea of greatest good for the greatest number. We really need to think about fair distribution, which we've already begun talking about. And then in understanding the values of the communities affected, we have a lot of obligations by following the public health ethics um, analysis framework. So um, we need to do, I, we've mentioned before that we need to do asset assessments. So who is already available in the community? Um, and one of our chat uh, members, Julieta, mentioned how resourceful members of your community, communities can be. So recognizing that fully supporting the concept of interdependence and engaging in public participation, engagement and involving sort of throughout the process. Um, and of course, respecting individuals along the way, even as you're caring for the community as a whole. Another principle that's really powerful is the concept of transparency. And that's come up in some of our, the former um, panel's conversation. I would say it's really based on a very deep respect for all persons and communities, um, supporting values and principles and processes for allocation decisions should then be made very clear. Um, they should be understandable and they should be open for review along the way. So these are powerful. And then we move to two of the principles that I think have tremendous bearing on our conversation today. And that again, we have begun talking about together and that is social justice and fairness, as well as equity. And I think equity must you know, be named, must be critically named. So um, when we talk about health justice and equity, we're talking about um, any steps that we can take to make sure that individuals and communities have an equal opportunities to be healthy with an equitable distribution of benefits, burdens, and opportunities for health to try to move toward um, equality. So equity is really pr a primary concept here. Um, so we need to be asking, what are the causes of existing disparities and inequity, and how are we addressing them, and what is needed in light of this? And so we've already talked about this with Dr. Hall, so I'm going to fairly quickly move through a few slides that simply emphasize the shortage of healthcare professionals. If in order for us to look at disparities, we have to look at the lack of resources available um, as we think about access. The number of patients per physician in the rural areas, about two times that for the number of patients per physician in urban areas. There are fewer primary care physicians, and then there's fewer pediatricians in the a rural health um, environment. Uh, more uh, rural health providers, by the way, are nearing retirement. So we need to have a plan for attracting new healthcare providers to rural areas. And of course, the shortages have an impact on health, such as um, indicated here, the, the teen birth rate um, changes. We've talked a little bit about how far people have to travel in rural areas to to actually access a primary care provider. And in Georgia, I'm constantly surprised at how many counties have one primary provider in their, in their community. Dr. Hall showed this slide. I think it's powerful to know that 174 rural hospitals closed between 2005 and now, with a greater increase over the last decade. And this just um, highlights that in 2019 alone, 
we had 19 additional hospitals closed. So the, there seems to be an increasing uh, percentage or amount of hospitals that are closing. There has been an assessment. This one is by um, the Cheris um, Rural Health Center that indicated, and this was back in January of this year, pre-COVID-19, in a sobering way that 454 hospitals were vulnerable to, to closure um, that had not already um, closed. And again, with much vulnerability in the Southeast and in the lower Great Plains, so two regions that have already been hard hit. Um, they looked at a number of variables um, and we can talk about that later um, if you're interested. And of course, in addition to um, whole hospital closures, there are particular services like obstetric services that have dropped drastically um, over the last decade and a half um, and are causing um, additional scarcity of, of resources in those counties and, and really in those regions as well. So importantly, um, I want to focus for just a moment on COVID-19. So um, in, back in April, we saw increasing warnings of financial concerns for already fragile rural hospitals, such as in this, this article. And then um, in August and continuing today, this story continues. So the president of the Alabama Hospital Association indicated that nearly 80% of Alabama rural hospitals started out 2020 with negative balance sheets and, and just a, a week or two of uh, cash on hand. And then with COVID-19, um, a large percentage of their income dropped as patients avoided coming in, going to the emergency room or doing do going to doctor's appointments or doing elective surgeries. So the financial situation, if you will, worsened um, further. So I think it's important that we recognize, we've talked a little bit about this today, that there has been an exacerbation um, as well as a light kind of shown, making increasingly visible the pre-existing rural health disparities. So we know that in general, rural and urban, that comorbidities, certain ones, place individuals more at risk for poor outcome with COVID-19. Um, and often there's an overlap with some of the most prevalent health conditions that Dr. Hall mentioned and causes of death in rural communities, um, also associated with socioeconomic factors, poverty, lack of access, and systemic racism. So uh, we need to be able to address, of course, these causes of inequity. I will um, show you a couple of resources in case you're not familiar with them. I hope most of you are, that there is um, a COVID-19 health equity dashboard um, that has, was funded um, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and is a partial, partially uh, run by colleagues at Emory that begins to look specifically at every county in the United States and gathers a number of the factors um, that impact, um, including comorbidities, socioeconomic level, um, housing, et cetera. So that's a powerful tool uh, that you might be interested in, in uh, as accessing. Also, the COVID racial data tracker. Um, this is a joint project of University Center for Anti-Racism and the, and the COVID Tracker Program, which is um, interestingly was started by two journalists associated with the Atlantic in a volunteer basis. Um, this tracking system also shows you, for example, by state, the percentage of uh, the population that fall within various racial or ethnic groups, and then the amount, the percentage of individuals in that state that um, actually um, died from COVID-19. So you begin to see the inequities and the disparities very clearly demonstrated. And the last one that I'm sure most of you know, certainly CDC folks do, is the Social Vulnerability Index, which takes into account um, about 15 different um, indicators or factors that lead to social vulnerability. So all of these are excellent tools as we think about further assess assessments of our community and um, what we do. So um, with my last couple of slides here, next steps. Um, I think that continued assessment of, again, an asset assessment, things we have, but also where 
where do we need to make a difference in particular communities, as well as an emphasis on transparency about that is important. That we do look for opportunities to be inclusive of um, all parts of our communities and public engagement and public involvement, people at the table. Um, there's an interesting initiative in Georgia that's been funded by the Healthcare Georgia Foundation called the Two Georgias Initiative that is working really closely with, I think, 11 different communities listening. They built their own coalitions to, um, to bring to the table to decide which way to go. Um, gap identification of next steps uh, valued by the community members themselves. Uh, we've talked a little bit about payment issues. Um, certainly there were congressional, congressional federal relief funds that were um, given in April. Um, so that would re reimburse hospitals related to their Medicare payments. But there was finally um, a recognition that there needed to carve out funds for rural hospitals and COVID-19 hotspots that made a difference. We need uh, a continued and enhanced um, funding for Medicaid and Medicare services. Workforce training, uh, clinician placements. We, there was some discussion of recruitment and retaining of clinicians in rural areas and, and how would we go about doing that. That, um, that is a powerful commitment and we, we may want to talk further about that. Sorry, moved on too quickly. Okay, um, and then public education, uh, investments in telehealth. And telehealth is an interesting question. We see the pros and cons sometimes of telehealth, but being able to have that as a, a potential venue for accessing care, I think it can be powerful. And I would ask us to be doing ethics assessments for all of the programs that we are um, considering as we move forward. There are a number of projects or models and uh, Lena, uh, when our earliest speaker talked about the Rural Health Information Hub, there are a number of projects there that might be interesting to you as you look for models moving forward. So with that, again, giving our time, I'm going to stop and say thank you and uh, would be happy to, if we have any time to answer questions or um, make further comments. Okay, well, thank you. Um... Dr. Hall and Ms. Kinlaw, um, we do have time for one question and it'll be for each of you. Um, the first question is for you specifically, Dr. Dr. Hall. Um, as, as hospitals continue to close across the country, can you talk about any innovations in the rural healthcare delivery system to continue ensuring insur access? And are other organizations filling gaps or new models of care emerging? That's a great question, thanks. Um, so I did post in the Q&A, there's a link, CMS just announced their chart model, which is specifically focused on rural hospitals. It's just announced last month. Um, and they've had a couple of different uh, strategies that they've been employing. The other thing to notice, um, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy that Dr. Knudsen mentioned, um, they have a lot of different grant programs where they are working to try to help rural hospitals. They, um, they've got TA centers and different models that they're also trying. Okay, okay, thank you, Dr. Hall. And Ms. Pillow, uh, a question for you. How can the field of public health address the issues of access to care in rural areas when even the definition or concept of access to care is unclear and complex? That's a great question. I mean, I, I really do feel that there are opportunities for us to start with where we are, right? Start with our own communities start with the kind of asset assessment that was discussed earlier to say, are there some beginning points um, that we can, we can recognize that we can name and begin there? Now, having said that, I really appreciated Dr. Uh, Daniel Miller's comment about managing inequities is not enough. So in addition to moving from our the local area and on specific issues that we can, we can examine, I think we also have to be advocates in this area and particularly advocates for um, understanding um, the sources of inequities in our areas 
and uh, across states and actually um, now finally doing something about them. They're so long standing, but there's a visibility now that I think we might, we could build on. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kenlaw. So again, thank you, Dr. Paul and Ms. Kenlaw for your, for your presentation on this very important topic. Before we move on to our next plenary session, um, I want to let everybody know if you know that we are running a few minutes behind schedule, but um, we do have two very exciting remaining plenary sessions that will also include a student poster award session. So, um, so please um, stay around um, for these next two, next two sessions and our student award uh, session as well. And we appreciate your patience. Okay. Our next plenary session will focus on looking at the physical determinants of rural health, addressing the natural and built environments and environmental justice in communities. Our two presenters today for this very important topic is Dr. Kristen Abilzo. Dr. Abilzo currently serves as the Associate Professor within the Department of Social and Behavioral Health Sciences program. He's also the Program Director of Research and Evaluation Health Research Center, West Virginia University School of Public Health. His research interests include health promotion program evaluation and, socio and socio-ecological determinants of physical activity, including policy and the built environment. Dr. Abilso has multiple peer-reviewed publications about Morgantown area rail trails, health impact assessment, physical activity planning, and evaluation of state level health promotion programming. A primary focus of his recent research has been understanding the social ecological determinants of physical activity in rural areas of the United States. Following him will be Dr. Leonard Ortman. Dr. Leonard Ortman currently serves as Senior Ethics Consultant with CDC's Public Health Ethics and Strategy Unit. Dr. Ortman provides ethics training and consults for CDC staff and programs, including emergency response. Prior to CDC, Dr. Ortman taught ethics and other topics at the college level. Most recently, he was Senior Associate for Programs at the Tuskegee University National Center for Bioethics. So please welcome and welcome me in joining Dr. Abilso and Dr. Ortman for the for the presentation. All right, thank you, Craig. Uh, it's a treat, a real honor and a privilege to be here. Hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, and with that, I'm gonna try to catch us up on time a little bit, so we'll dive right in. I appreciate the introduction and everything that is going on here. There we go, got control. So um, I'm gonna talk specifically about physical activity as it relates to the determinants of rural health and the natural and built environment, um, along with uh, just on behalf of colleagues that I've worked with on uh, multiple projects about this. Um, and these colleagues are scattered throughout the U.S. and do a lot of rural physical activity work. Um, so I'll talk a little, uh, try to catch us up a little bit, talk for about 15 minutes or so, and then turn it over to Dr. Ortman. Um, so a few of the things, uh, just to give you an outline of what I'll talk about, um, I'll frame it right uh, from the get-go on the ethical issue, talk a little bit about our approach in this work uh, on uh, uh, positive deviance, and, and then talk about a couple of, very briefly talk about uh, some work we've done to understand what some of the natural and built environmental uh, factors are that are uh, associated uh, with physical activity in rural places. So kick back for a few minutes here and, and enjoy. So we saw we saw some of the public health ethics definitions and information on the uh, last plenary. Uh, I'm specifically going to be talking about um, how we work in rural areas to clarify, prioritize, and justify potential courses of public health action, specifically as it relates to physical activity in this case, um, and, and, and working from a place where it is based on um, the ethical principle of listening to stakeholders and the values and beliefs of those stakeholders and building a good scientific evidence base. A little 
little more information about framing up the ethical issue. As we saw, um, thank you, Dr. Hall, for saying it's not all doom and gloom in rural areas, but we do have health disparities in rural areas, as we all know, um, including, uh, as was mentioned, a lower prevalence of physical activity. Now, what we know, though, on um, from the scientific evidence is changing the natural or changing the built environment, those interventions are largely based on a very urban-centric evidence base. And uh, my colleagues, uh, Renee and Cindy uh, from Baylor and Oregon Health Sciences University that um, we've written a few times over the, over the last decade, basically, to let's, let's work on expanding and learning from rural places. So. Uh, one of the ethical issues to consider today is whether it is actually ethical to recommend these rural built environment interventions that are largely focused on um, planning and zoning policy and, and heavily built uh, on policy uh, changes. Um, is, it, is it ethical to recommend those in rural areas, even though it's based on a very urban centric evidence base? So further, we saw this in the last presentation, um, you know, there are many challenges that exist in rural places. We all know that. Uh, but there are also opportunities, and we want to work from that public health uh, ethics lens. Um, one of the, as Dr. Ortman and I were talking in, in preparing this, one of the challenges for sure in the research enterprise is bringing in enough uh, resources to develop those long-term relationships in these places that um, have been victims of abstraction for generations. Um, of natural resources, of people, of health information, and of knowledge. Um, you know, based on the doom and gloom, however, there is a powerful opportunity. Uh, and we've talked about this. Um, Causey and colleagues wrote about the rural mortality penalty. Um, with, you know, we can see the gap that has been created. The rural areas are experiencing, you know, roughly 150 to 200 more deaths per 100,000 people and the trends are not good. So in the physical activity literature, however, we know that uh, like globally, the lack of physical activity is the fourth leading cause of death. So in these areas that are the least active, there is a tremendous opportunity. If we can get people moving, those that are least active, we can see the most benefits in health outcomes. Um, so quickly shifting to our group and what we've been doing, um, Thanks to CDC, some of the Prevention Research Center support to the Physical Activity Policy Research and Evaluation Network, PAPRIN. Uh, you can look them up at paprin.org. Um, you know, in, in this iteration and previous iterations, we've had a rural active living work group, and we really have a chip on our shoulders to, to build this rural evidence base. Um, we have worked to identify um, some of the most active, most rural places. Um, those are physical, uh, sorry, physical activity positive deviance. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then from there, we had really our, in our second purpose there was to identify these environmental factors that are associated with physical activity using national data sets at the county level. And then also by going and listening, going and doing in depth comparative case studies, qualitative work in three counties. And you can see um, our rural positive deviance subgroup. Uh, we are from all over the country. And there are, there are more that help advise us as well. So, of course, for those that haven't worked and, and uh, haven't really uh, read up on positive deviance, uh, you know, one of the first things to better understand what it is. And it's a real positive spin on our philosophy to research. Um, this is largely done in very resource poor communities, um, mostly in developing nations. Um, where you go and you find on, through on the ground work a few individuals or families um, that are employing sort of uncommon beneficial practices that allow them, in spite of their lack of resources, to have better outcomes compared to their peers and their similarly impoverished neighbors. You can see, actually, back in 2002, uh, there was a food and nutrition bulletin supplement uh, that looked at places all over the world and uh, largely rural places in developing uh, countries and trying to identify those beneficial practices. Um, I guess in common, uh, common parlance, uh, some of the blue zone work is, is very much a positive deviance approach. So using um, um, work by Laura Dwyer, Lindgren, and colleagues, um, 
out at the University of Washington. We use county level physical activity, uh, prevalence of meeting physical activity guidelines uh, for both women and men, so females and males. Um, go back one. And we identified essentially the positive deviance in the most, uh, um, from among the most rural places. And not surprisingly, those are out west and in New England. Whereas Appalachia, you know, I'm in Morgantown, West Virginia, so it didn't surprise me that Appalachia and uh, areas down into Texas um, were some of the non-positive deviants. Um, sometimes I, I might shift to calling them negative deviants, but the places that are not doing as well. So quickly, I understand there are much greater details to this, but um, we use those, um, I think it was like 26 county level environment measures um, from social, transportation, and built and natural um, environment measures um, and, and ran some exploratory factor analyses to um, clump them together and see what kind of a parsimonious model we could, we could create and then multiple linear regression to identify the association from those factors with the prevalence of uh, meeting physical activity guidelines uh, separately for males and females. Obviously, there's much greater detail to that, um, but we could, we could get into that a little bit. But we defined rurality, as is always, we've talked about this in every presentation. We actually used 2010 uh, census data, um, the percentage of the population in rural areas in a county. All our measures are at the county level. We actually started with quartiles, but we found that those uh, counties, and you can see on the slide there are 389 of them, where 100% of the population is defined as living in a rural area. Those were really dominating that uh, top quartile of rurality. So we separated them, they were very different, so we separated them out and then did quartiles from there, from rural A um, down to our least rural, uh, the urban areas. So let me orient you to the slide a little bit. On the left side here we see um, uh, the regression coefficients for all the counties in the study, so all the counties around the U.S. Blue um, are the, uh, are the uh, regression coefficients for our natural environment factors. Red are social environment, uh, green are built environment, and uh, the purple is our transportation uh, environment factor. I'm going to focus only on the natural and built environments. Um, and what we can see, and this pattern holds true for males, that the natural environment factors stand out as being significant in every quartile, or every, um, every quartile except our least rural and most urban counties. We also see in the green that the built environment measures are significant, uh, uh, significantly associated with female physical activity guideline prevalence in our two most rural counties on the far right and our least rural or most urban on the left. Now what's interesting is that um, the natural environment measures are driven by air temperature, heat index, and percent exposure to sun. So uh, we, we have some, um, um, you know, uh, we have some, uh, sorry, some data from many different data sets. So that's what really drove the natural environment, but that's not significant in the most urban counties. If we combine that with a look within the factors uh, for the built environment, the built environment in the rural B and the rural C, the most rural areas, the factors that loaded most heavily were access, um, you know, proximate access to elementary schools and parks. But in the urban area, it's generally just access to exercise opportunities. Um, and we think if we combine, these are very preliminary analyses, if we combine the natural and built measures, we see that in the urban areas, there is more protection, uh, probably in indoor facilities, to be active. And that negates the natural environment influence. Um, like I said, these are preliminary analyses. And we're going to talk more about these. Get rid of the laser pointer, give me a second. Okay. So like I said, the, the pattern holds true in the um, physical activity guidelines for males. Okay. 
but from a you know national data set that only tells us from a big picture something you know something's going on that's different in rural than urban. So um, I actually went to Texas um, to visit for my first time in Texas and um, did some more in-depth case study, comparative case study work. And I went to two counties, you can see uh, some details about those in green that were positive deviance and one in red, uh, the data from that county are in the red, um, that is not a positive deviant. And basically we um, looked at two kind of distinct positive deviant counties as far as um, you know, what they look like um, compared to the negative one. And you can see, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you can see there's a definite difference in the physical activity guideline prevalence for females and for males. Um, and actually some associations that are contrary, these, uh, you can see the proximity to elementary schools, which is as expected, but some contrary evidence about population density and access to exercise opportunities, that, um, which is why you can see why it's so complicated. Those are things from the urban evidence that would suggest um, these, uh, I'm sorry, the rural, uh, what we're seeing in here is contrary to what we see in the urban evidence. So um, the qualitative work comparative case study of those two positive uh, deviant counties and one non-positive um, went to the largest municipality in the county and the next largest. We definitely made sure to hit the county seat. Um, collected stakeholder interviews, key stakeholder interviews, snowball sampling. Our primary contact was the cooperative extension agent. Um, and they introduced us to people from there um, and it worked pretty nicely. Um, we also did kind of person on the street interviews, intercepting people um, and talking to them about physical activity and the people and the places and or policies that really influence them. And also um, those of us that went just did experiential, experiential observations, walking, running, biking, whatever it may have been, just to get a feel for the place. Um, what I'll present first is kind of the universal findings across all three counties. Um, and I think those that have been to Texas, uh, it is no surprise that culturally sports are very important. So scholastic sports really matter. Um, what was interesting under uh, this leisure activity, of course we measure leisure time physical activity as our primary measure uh, through the BRFSS. But that concept uh, may be difficult. Um, I heard essentially in all three counties, uh, variations of the quote that if it ain't work, it ain't worth doing or I mean, literally two men in two different counties said, uh, boy, if I'm running, you better run too, because somebody's chasing me. So this idea, and of course I took it to heart, this idea of very purposeful activity for work may be easier to accept than leisure activity or doing activity for my own health's sake. Um, universal was that legislative policies, capital P policies, did not matter as much as organizational policies, and we'll see more about that in a moment. So little key policies mattered. And as we all know, human resources um, for physical activity uh, are very limited. So what, what and I'll, I'll conclude with this, but essentially when we compared what the, the themes to what we heard, uh, the themes of what we heard in the positive deviant counties against the non-positive, um, they tended to form, for those that have worked in the community capitals framework, they tended to fall in that community capitals framework. So first, social capital. Social harmony matters. The one non-positive deviant county had a, um, it was about a 30% uh, population, 30% um, of the population in their county seat was African American. And I literally heard, quote unquote, those people. Um, so social harmony definitely matters. And I did not hear that in the other counties that were um, predominantly white, so. Um, Social norms about lifetime physical activity are critical. So in the non-positive deviant county, it was very much about sports and nothing else. But in the others, they were, uh, they did have like walking groups and other things to get people out um, doing leisure time activity. They had a parks and rec department in the two positive deviant counties and not in the one that was not a positive deviant. So there was some interesting stuff going on uh, for social capital. Human capital obviously is limited, like I said, um, but in that non-positive deviant county, the leadership of the county was not representative of that population. It was old and white, and that was about it. So the voice, like we heard, giving people the power very early on. There really was very limited power for people of color in that uh, non-positive deviant county. 
similarly, the amount of focus of the human capital on physical activity by those key leaders mattered. Um, in the non-positive using county, they uh, were very much focused on substance use disorder um, issues that we would probably associate um, just a child welfare issues and other things like that and not physical activity. Though I could hear sprinklings of um, intersectionality of those things, of getting people active to prevent substance use and things like that. They just weren't there yet. Organizational capital mattered. I talked about little p policies before. Um, access to facilities. Uh, literally in a non-positive Union County, they had beautiful new school facilities that were locked. They didn't let people in. Um, their schools were behind gates and barbed wire, their playgrounds. In the positive using counties, it was wide open. They actually invited people to use the facilities uh, pretty much at all times, other than when there was a football game, of course. Um, even the rodeos, which are very uh, you know, uh, popular and very important in Texas, those were locked uh, in the non-positive using county, but wide open in the positive ones. Um, lastly, on the financial capital piece, um, it was interesting to see the positive using counties were um, pretty stable as far as employment goes. Uh, in one of them, they actually had a private prison that had just closed, so the men actually were starting to leave to do uh, work remotely and send money back, kind of work in shifts for, for weeks at a time and then come back. Um, but in the non-positive using county, they were dominated by shift work and nursing homes, some overnight healthcare kind of work. So we surmise that that impacts things in a couple different ways. First is funding for public facilities. Uh, for Parks and Rec. Like I mentioned, there was no Parks and Rec department in the non-positive union county. Um, so budgeting was very tough when obviously uh, family income increased and decreased. Um, but also it impacted the human aspect because people would oftentimes pick up shifts as much as they could. They were working uh, in non-positive union county, excuse me, they were working kind of the night shift so they can't really volunteer and be around for physical activity programming. Um, the schools just said, we take care of the children as much as we can, um, and they come to our houses and they really care about those children because the parents just can't be there. Um, so there's a lot of really complex stuff. Tried to sum uh, summarize it here. Um, I'd be happy to uh, take questions later, but I think I'm going to turn it over. I call this interrogation time, but I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Orton from here. So I appreciate, I really do appreciate the time um, and look forward to hearing from you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abildso. And uh, before I turn to your uh, discussion of your paper, I wanted to give a shout out uh, from all the uh, golden tigers I saw on the chat session. Uh, and as I mentioned, I, uh, or as uh, the uh, introducer mentioned, I uh, taught for a number of years uh, at Tuskegee University National Center for Bioethics, and I lived in the city of Tuskegee for a number of years. And so, um, tell a little story about that, that when I lived there, uh, you know, I had some neighbors and one neighbor in particular used to use this saying. And I think it's a, provides a subtext for all I'm going to say. And when he'd be describing the city of Tuskegee, he'd sometimes conclude by saying, it ain't much, but it's ours. And I think that saying sort of is, is, is very interesting. The first part, it ain't much, sort of reflects what people from the outside might think of it, you know, uh, you know, compared to Atlanta or Auburn or, or Montgomery. Maybe Tuskegee doesn't seem like much, but it's their home. And by saying it's ours, they own it, they affirm it, and they recognize that, that you know, it's, it's their place. So I think that's very important. Uh, and I think it's very relevant also to, to your talk and, and to your approach. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I'm advancing or uh, how to do that. You should, you should Oops. have control, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Oops, so there's a disclaimer. Uh, these are my views and not the views of the CDC. So what I'm gonna do is distinguish complementary approaches to public health interventions. And those are uh, what I'm calling a top-down public health uh, perspective versus a bottom-up public health perspective. 
And I'm going to interpret Professor Abilzo's approach to positive deviance in terms of this top-down, bottom-up distinction. So the top-down uh, public health interventions, uh, to describe that, I'm going to use uh, former director of CDC director Tom Fried's notion of winnable battle criteria. And those were that, you know, you have data on the burden or impact of a certain condition. Uh, you have evidence-based solutions that address that burden and that, that you have the ability to scale up uh, your interventions to the size of, of the burden and tools to evaluate the success of your interventions. And if you have all those criteria, then according to Dr. Frieden, you had uh, a winnable public health battle. And uh, you know, this is more or less as a condensed version of what you might say the traditional public health science approach. Now, this whole approach, uh, the efficiency of it and the scalability of this top-down approach depends on these interventions being replicable in a variety of settings. However, you cannot always assume they are. And, and the picture there illustrates that when they aren't, you can make the mistake of trying to shove a round intervention into a square hole. It just might not fit the particular community in question. So that's when this notion of a, a bottom-up public health intervention arises. Uh, and it's really the idea of finding the best fit for the community. So we not only need evidence-based practice, we need practice-based evidence first, you know, that's based on working with communities and seeing what works. And so, uh, I, you know, uh, it, it mentions that I'm in the office of uh, science, or I am in the office of science at CDC, and one of our other offices or divisions there is the Office of Tech Innovation. And they've been pushing this idea of human-centered design and public health. And it's really represents uh, sort of almost the essence of what you, you get when you, you emphasize community engagement, stakeholder analysis or community-based participatory approach. And it begins with an empathic listening to your end users, <coughs> excuse me, to the community. And uh, I noticed that uh, in several of his slides, Dr. Abildso talks about all of the discussions he had with, with, with people in the communities that he researched. So you really have to get out there and see what that community is like. And you need to translate uh, this community input into intervention design. You can't simply take something that was developed and works in an urban setting and believe uh, that it's necessarily gonna work in some other setting. So even if you do begin with something from el elsewhere, you always have to run it by the community. And so the, the end goal you want is something uh, which you might call user-friendly design, something that has been designed for the end user, not something that, oh, you know, I want to do this research. I'm going to fly in here, conduct this research because, you know, this worked in Detroit or this, this worked in some other cities. And I'm, you know, and I'm just going to sort of treat the, the population here as, you know, the next sort of installment of this uh, model to be replicated. Instead, what you have to do is you know, even if you do have some preconceived notions, you want to talk to the community, uh, you want to get their input, and you want to have several iterative loops of uh, discussion with them to make sure that the product that you get is going to resonate with that community. Okay, so looking now at what uh, Dr. Bildso has done with his notion of positive deviance, he avoids attempting to replicate what works in urban settings to rural settings. And I know several speakers have mentioned this idea that, you know, you can't just take stuff that worked in an urban environment and assume it's going to work somewhere else. Rather, you want to find indigenous solutions that taps into community resilience. You know, and a lot of times we hear when we're talking about rural health or minority health, uh, we always hear the bad side that uh, these communities have, you know, have all these terrible health measures, uh, that they're full of health disparities compared to, uh, you know, white populations. But I think that's, you know, you have to look at the 
glass half full sometimes and see that uh, you know these these folks in these areas have survived uh, despite uh, all of these disparities, despite the fact that uh, on on measures of social determinants of health, they lack resources, they lack hospitals, the education level is low, and yet you know they have survived. And like uh, my friend and neighbor in Tuskegee, he says, you know, it may not be much, but it's ours. And they are affirming uh, that life. So, uh, so if you're looking for solutions that might work, it's going to be more likely that such solutions will be appropriate in other similar counties. And so this is what I, I liked about Dr. Abilzo's approach, that he went and talked to folks in rural com communities that manifested these uh, positive deviants. And that if you're going to begin uh, a discussion with other rural communities, you're, you're going to take a solution that I think is, you know, halfway there towards this notion of uh, a bottom up approach uh, where you're uh, going to discuss it with the communities, but you, you know, what you're going to take as your preliminary model is one that stands a must much better chance of working in those communities because it's from a community uh, that is similar to theirs. So you'd still need to engage with these communities, uh, even if you, you know, you couldn't just assume that something that worked in one rural area is going to work in another, but it's more likely. And it's more likely that you'll achieve this end goal, a user-friendly uh, intervention, and one that resonates with other rural communities. So I applaud uh, Dr. Abilzo for, for his work. I think it's cutting edge. I think it is really listening uh, and engaging with communities. And um, I, I think he's going to have a lot of success with that. So uh, on that note, I'm going to stop and I'll be willing to entertain any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ortman and Dr. LB. Don't Charles. worry about it. <laughs> Dr. A is fine. <laughs> Dr. A, okay, great. So, you know, so we have um, one question that um, that came in, um, wanted to ask. Um, the question is, um, and I think this is particularly for you, Dr. A, um, have you done any work um, to examine the role um, the role intergenerational poverty plays within rural communities? No, I haven't. Um, I can almost guarantee if we're, I haven't with regard to physical activity specifically, and that's, that's primarily my focus. Um, I can almost guarantee that folks have, <laughs> I've never really looked into that uh, data, uh, that literature, um, but I can almost guarantee people have with different um, health outcomes rather than the behavior of physical activity. Yeah, I appreciate that question. Okay. Okay. Um, again, we want to thank um, both of you very much for your participation in today's forum uh, and addressing um, uh, a very important uh, topic, uh, looking at addressing the natural and built environments and environmental justice in communities. So thank, thanks to you both for your participation in today's forum. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. And now I would like to um, turn it over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Karen Boyer. Dr. Boyer is a senior advisor for research and health scientists here within our office. And she's gonna be, um, she's gonna be talking and presenting on our student poster award session. So Dr. Boyer, the floor is yours. Dr. Dr. Boyer, uh, we can't hear you. Yeah. 
Dr. Boyer, are you on, are you by chance on mute? So we can straight on one of them. Okay. We'll try. Okay. All right. We're gonna try to we're gonna stop the press here and see if we can find out find out um um why Hello? we can. Okay, it we can hear you now. Yes. I don't know what was wrong with the computer, but we were unmuted. Okay. I'm Dr. Boyer in the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. I'm going to be very brief because we are running behind time. So therefore, what I'm going to do is only introduce you to the students. We had a student poster presentation and it consisted of eight students. Out of the eight students, we had three students that were awarded third, second, and first place. Those students will be speaking today and they're also going to receive awards and they will be eligible to publish their work in the Journal of Healthcare, Science, and Humanities, published by the National Center for Healthcare and Research at Tuskegee University. The first place winner is Mr. Christopher Owens, who is a doctoral, postdoctoral scholar at Northwestern University Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing. The second place winner is Ms. Kellen Banks from Mooreville, Alabama, Monroeville, I'm sorry, Alabama, recent, who recently graduated from Tuskegee, Alabama. The first place winners are Ms. Catherine Gonzalez, who is currently a doctoral student in the Community Research and Action Program at Vanderbilt University, and Ms. Lee Branham, who is currently pursuing a PhD in community research and action at Peabody College at Vanderbilt University. I'm going to ask Mr. Christopher Owens to please give us a brief overview of his work. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. So my project was based on my dissertation, which is a community-based project for a local aid service organization who serves a rural uh, area in a Midwestern state. And I collaboratively uh, interviewed gay and bisexual men who live in uh, rural areas in that state and who are living with HIV about their lived experiences of being in and going through the rural HIV care continuum. And our results really show and speak to three ethical considerations. And the first is the ethics of measurement. So how do we measure the success of the world HIV care continuum rather than just measuring blood tests? Um, our participants face social determinants of health. So how else can we measure social determinants of health and um, successes uh, within that? The second is the ethics of practice. So how can we incorporate HIV care into primary care services, uh, which we know that HIV care services are lacking in rural areas. So how can we incorporate these um, into primary care settings? And the third is the ethics of decision making. Uh, social workers and public health uh, practitioners, as we know, are quite embedded in thinking about social determinants of health. Um, so how can we elevate them to be policy decision makers, not only on a national level, but also state and regional levels when we think about rural HIV care policies? So thank you. Chris is the third place winner. Now we're going to the second place winner, who is Ms. Kellen Banks from Tuskegee. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, now, now we can see you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kellen Banks. As she stated, I am a recent graduate from Tuskegee University's Master's in Public Health program. Um, I'm extremely grateful just to be able to have the opportunity to briefly present my research to you all, which was on the knowledge and awareness about cervical cancer and human papillomavirus among women living in Macon County, Alabama. 
So cervical cancer is a malignant tumor that grows in the lower area of a woman's cervix. It's typically caused by different strains of human papillomavirus, which is also commonly known as HPV. Alabama actually possesses the highest death rate for cervical cancer in the country, and most of those deaths take place in underserved populations that are similar to Macon County, Alabama. Um, many people lack the knowledge about HPV vaccinations and its ability to prevent cervical cancer if paired with the proper screenings. So the purpose of this study was to simply increase knowledge and the intention to have cervical cancer screenings by administering pre and post questionnaires pertaining to cervical cancer and HPV awareness before and after a short term educational based intervention. So I began campaigning throughout Macon County to sort of introduce the nature of the study to the community. Um, pre and post questionnaires were utilized for the collection of data before and after the intervention. And then descriptive statistics using chi-square and frequency tests were performed for analysis using SAS software. So we had a total of 100 women participants, 85% um, of which self-identified as Black, 65% were over the age of 30 and making less than $50,000 a year, 62% lived in the Tuskegee community, 73% were either single, widowed, or divorced, and more than 80% were in between their first year of college and graduate school, and 40% were currently working for pay. So um, based on the research, the findings showed uh, an increase in the participants' knowledge following the intervention. Uh, there was also a level of significance between the participants' education level and if they knew what cervical cancer was. So um, our findings suggest that cervical cancer interventions and treatment patterns targeted at disadvantaged women, particularly those living in black belt communities and rural communities such as Macon County, could have the potential to dramatically reduce high rates um, of cervical cancer with hopes of eventually eradicating this disease. Um, so that concludes my brief overview of my research. I would like to thank the organizers and judges for granting me with this opportunity. Thank you, Kellen. Okay, now we have the first place winners, who are Catherine Gonzalez and Ms. Lee Brenham. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Our poster was on addressing rural health um, equity and access in rural Tennessee. So rural populations in the U.S. are experiencing a decline in access to health care as rural hospitals are closing at rapid rates. Since 2010, 131 hospitals have closed across the U.S., with the majority occurring in the southeast. Tennessee holds the second highest rate with about 14 hospital closures and the highest rate of hospital closures per capita. To further understand the impact of hospital closures, three focus groups were conducted in five rural communities in Tennessee in partnership with the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign. Focus group sent questions centered on who was impacted the most by a closure, how closure decisions were made and communicated, what could have helped prevent a closure within the community, and then what helped mitigate the effects of a closure on the community. Uh, focus group sessions were held in Clay County, Carroll County, and a virtual session with Campbell, Scott, and Fentress counties. Overall, there were 40 participants in the focus groups. And then Catherine and I independently reviewed transcripts and coded them for themes, and the, then these were reviewed by the team at THCC. Several themes evolved around the significance of structural and contextual factors in shaping the differential experiences of community residents. The first being the level of awareness of key community stakeholders and closure decisions. In our focus groups, there are patterns of board members not being notified about the decision until immediately before the closure or were misinformed about the financial stability of the hospital, leaving them very blindsided. The second being concerns and dissatisfactions on the process of informing residents about the closure. This included hospital staff who were told that as long as they admitted one patient, they wouldn't have to worry or doubt their job stability. Many of them came to find out that that was important and had doctors brought in more patients, it would have made a difference to the closure decision. The third being about the disparate impact of eliminated services on everyday life experiences. This includes the loss of obstetrics care, emergency and specialty services, as well as dramatic increases in travel time to a hospital. The fourth theme focused on the varying sense of responsibility that a hospital can have towards the community. Many participants identified that corporate hospitals do not seem to feel that they owe the community any input in the closure process. Well, that would not have been the case with a public owned hospital. The fifth theme demonstrated the residents concern about the long term impact of the hospital closure on the community's economic well being, including 
real estate, tourism, and other industries. Moreover, without a local hospital, employees and patients were spending less money at local businesses. And the sixth theme highlighted the ways in which other organizations or services have had to compensate for the lack of a local hospital. So police officers are responding more to mental health issues than they did previously. And EMS personnel are also having to provide more emergency care as the distance to a hospital is much farther. So in conclusion, multiple public health ethical concerns were identified through our analysis, including how hospital closure decisions are made, which stakeholders are involved, and who justifies these decisions. Addressing, th addressing these questions is critical in terms of the ethical responsibility of ensuring access to healthcare in rural hospitals and rural communities with competing private and public interests. The current findings will be utilized to inform future policy recommendations at the federal, state, and local levels and, and to compile a toolkit with community strategies to prevent or mitigate the effects of a hospital closure. Finally, we want to thank THCC for all their hard work in developing this project and allowing us to be a part of it. Thank you, everyone. Hey, I would like to thank each of you for presenting today and for participating in the poster process. And I'm not sure if we have any time for questions and answers. Do we, Craig? No. Oh, Dr. Burry, no, we, we didn't have any, um, no, no, we didn't have any questions that came through. Um, so I want to thank you, Dr. Boyer, and, and particularly each of you for your, for your presentations, your poster presentations, and congratulations uh, to, to the winners. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I think these were excellent presentations. Yes, they were. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're up to our, our final um, presentation um, for today's um, forum. Um, Dr. Carr James, um, a closing forum is working to achieve health equity in rural communities. Dr. James, currently serves as president and CEO at Grantmakers in Health. Prior to joining GIH, Dr. James served as director of the Office of Minority Health at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where she provided leadership, vision, and direction to advance the United States Department of Health and Human Services and CMS goals related to reducing disparities and achieving health equity for vulnerable populations including racial and ethnic populations, persons with disabilities, sexual and gender minorities, and persons living in rural communities. Under her guidance, CMS developed its first CMS equity plan to improve quality in Medicare. Its first rural health strategy created an ongoing initiative to help individuals understand their coverage and connect to care increased the collection and reporting of demographic data, and developed numerous resources to help stakeholders in their efforts to reduce disparities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, uh, Craig, for that warm introduction, and congratulations as well to our student winners who just presented. It's really exciting to see the future of our, our workforce and researchers. Um, so, let's see here. I am uh, going to move us kind of quickly here since um, I know I am holding you up between whatever um, activities you have to celebrate the end of the week and um, as we are moving forward. So, I'm trying to just figure out, um, and maybe I'm not seeing the control panel here for, there we go. Okay. So, um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about achieving health equity in a role. Um, America, and you've already heard kind of who, uh, where I am now at Grantmakers in Health, and we are an organization that's working with um, over 240 health uh, funders and philanthropy organizations and philanthropy serving organizations to improve uh, health outcomes through better philanthropy, and you can see a number of the areas in which we are engaged in, including um, rural health. You've already um, heard about the disparities that we see in rural communities compared to urban areas, as well as um, a number of the challenges that they face. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the COVID disparities, but I think that this has also been something we have covered in the afternoon, but just want to highlight that um, it is something that is affecting nearly all rural counties and um, has been touched by 
the pandemic and many of them have a number um, of deaths and then you can see the rural case rate is lower but does not mean that it is not um, having a strong impact on those health systems which tend to be smaller. Um, the other thing is when you look at some of the data of where it's happening locally, you can see that the incidence rates, the new cases that are popping up are in some cases very comparable to some of the top uh, urban counties that we have. But in terms of what we wanted to talk about really that I was asked to focus on today, just want to provide a little bit of a snapshot of some of the racial and ethnic disparities that we see in rural communities. Um, and much of what I'm going to present is some work that we were did when I was at CMS with our colleagues here at the uh, Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, including Karen Gouye, who you just saw. So um, it was a great opportunity for us to work together to lift up and shed light on some of the disparities that we see. And one of the reasons that it's important is when we think about rural communities and who lives there, I think these are some of the images that people really um, kind of come to mind. And less so do we think about the diversity that's in rural communities. Um, clearly, in our urban areas, they are more diverse in terms of the number of racial and ethnic minorities, but it does not mean that there isn't diversity within rural communities by race and ethnicity. Um, so this is the data from the last census in terms of what the distribution of the population looks like, and you can see that in metropolitan counties that um, about 60% of the population identified as non-Hispanic white whereas in rural communities it was closer to 80 percent. Um, we'll see what the change is in the next census as we move forward. The other thing is that diversity is represented not just by race and ethnicity but a number of other communities. So we have um, several million individuals who are um, LGBT and rural communities as well as a number of individuals with disability uh, who are living in these communities. So there's a lot of diversity that we see. I'm going to focus much of my comments today and discussion on racial and ethnic disparities within rural communities as we look at some of those challenges um, and to highlight a few of those as not going as much depth as we would like just to kind of make sure we stick pretty close to time. Um, so as we look at fair poor health, you can see overall about one in five adults in rural communities identifies their health as fair poor, but higher rates are uh, found for those who are um, African American or Black, Hispanic and Latinx, as well as those who are American Indian and Alaska Native. When we look at um, obesity rates in rural communities, um, we see that there, as in other communities, higher rates of obesity for those who are African American. And um, something that really concerning is that green bar of the 12% who have a BMI over 40, um, as well as high rates in American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, we also see in terms of the access to coverage, you heard earlier about some of the challenges that rural communities have in general, but within those rural communities we see that um, Hispanics, African Americans also have more challenges associated with access and care in terms of those who are reporting that they didn't have a doctor's visit due to coverage, uh, no health coverage, sorry, um, and similarly didn't see that. Um, we started at CMS putting out a, a rural disparities report, similar to what the National Healthcare Disparities and National Healthcare Quality Report is looking at some of the heat and caps measures in Medicare Advantage and fee for service. And this shows you when we look at those uh, heat as clinical quality measures in Medicare Advantage that within um, the plans that are in our contracts in rural areas and serving rural beneficiaries, you can see that a number of them, um, African American and Hispanic beneficiaries have worse quality of care compared to those who are uh, non-Hispanic white. And there are some measures for which um, minority groups are receiving better care. Um, so those are the ones in yellow at the top of that. Uh, but overall, we do see consistent disparities. One other thing to note is that not always do we see that the disparities are worse for our communities of color. And this shows you with depression that while we do have higher rates for those who are American Indian and Alaska Native. Uh, the next highest rate is actually experienced by those who are non-Hispanic white in rural communities and lower rates experienced by um, other populations. We also know that where you live matters. And when we look at disparities, I just pull up within um, the state of Georgia, and this is our mapping, or the mapping Medicare disparities tool that was developed by the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services Office of Minority Health. 
Um, and here I just highlight uh, Dooley County as one example. Each of the counties that is solid represents a rural county. And this is the black-white uh, disparity in diabetes hospitalization rates. And you can see in uh, Dooley County for African Americans, which is referenced here as the primary group, the rate is 24 per thousand beneficiaries compared to two for um, non-Hispanic white uh, beneficiaries. So significant disparities and those that are darker blue represent those higher disparities. Um, to drill down and look and see what's happening as well within COVID disparities, one of the things just wanted to share with Case is um, some interesting correlations of what we're seeing, which um, given what we know about the disparities in COVID is not all that surprising. Um, these counties represent the 10 uh, rural counties with the highest total uh, reported COVID cases, um, at least as of two days ago. I think it's still the same as of a few days um, ago. But as you can see, what I circled in red, going back to that demographic that I showed you earlier, where about 80% of uh, individuals in rural communities identified as non-Hispanic white, you can see that for many of these counties, um, the representation for non-Hispanic life is significantly lower. Um, highlighting there in McKinley, number two in New Mexico, it's only 8% of the population, or it's Maverick, Texas, and Star, uh, down towards the bottom, where you see at 3%. We also look at uh, the broadband subscription rates, where you're talking about about half or less than 60% of the population with access to broadband. And similarly, when we think about those who speak a language other than English at home, um, you have some communities like Rapid, Texas, uh, where 93% of those individuals are speaking a language other than English at home, um, and probably speak English as well. So what that means when we think about information distribution, how people are getting access to that information, access to care, other needs that can help them to uh, protect themselves and their families, these can be things that we need to take into consideration as we are thinking about our messaging and looking at how we're supporting different communities. One other thing is we think about the demographics of who lives in rural communities, and we often think about those individuals as being older um, and sicker and poorer. And in general, that is the case relative to our rural, uh, our urban counterparts. But we also see that there's variability within that. So here, um, just kind of pointing out that for Hispanic adults, and those who are Asian and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander, 60% of them, more than 60% of them, are between the ages of 18 and 44. So their needs in terms of the healthcare system are going to be a little different than those who are at the 65 and older stage, um, that 18 or 44 are still within that childbearing age, and to access to maternal health that uh, Dr. Hall had mentioned and some of the, the challenges associated with that in rural communities is something that um, may be needed more there than in some of the other communities. Similarly, when we think about those with less income, um, you can see that for African Americans, uh, as well as American Indians and Alaska Natives and Hispanics in rural areas, that 60%, about 60% or uh, so, have an income of less than $25,000. Um, and again, thinking about implications related to COVID and other access to care issues, um, the ability to buy personal protective equipment for transportation, um, to pay out-of-pocket costs, all of those things uh, to support and stay healthy are going to be much harder for some of those communities. Finally, um, as we all know, where you live matters. And uh, as you can see, the distribution of the communities looks pretty different depending on where you, who you are. So 94% of rural African Americans live in the South, um, and 60% of Hispanics are in the uh, South as well, with um, and when we look at American Indians and Alaska Natives, as well as Asian and Pacific Islander, uh, higher percentages of some of them in the West um, and smaller percentages in the South. And why this matters, um, you have seen this figure a couple of times. Um, it is a slightly different take on this figure, which is the rural hospital closure. So um, each of the previous presenters shared with you the hospital closures between uh, decades and sort of what happened before 2010 and what's happened since. These are the hospitals that are closed as compared to those who have converted to something else. So the dark blue, the blue dots are the ones that are completely closed. Um, so again, 
more risk of that happening kind of in the South. And again, just the figure I just shared in terms of the distribution, those closures, there's evidence that it's disproportionately affecting some of those communities of color who are there. Um, and Dr. Hall also mentioned the financial distress that we see uh, with the hospitals, a number of rural hospitals. These are uh, those critical access hospitals that are at high risk of financial distress. So um, access is, is really uh, something that we need to be thinking about. As we're looking ahead um, to thinking about um, how we can achieve health equity in rural communities, um, I share that, you know, just so we're all in the same mindset of what we mean uh, when we talk about health equity, it is you know, giving people what they need to achieve their highest level of health. It doesn't mean giving everyone the same thing. And as we think about what it takes to um, achieve that and focusing on some of those place-based strategies to help people uh, design solutions that um, address the problems that are specific to their communities and to give resources that we need. Um, as Dr. Hall mentioned, the chart model that just came out. But there have been other models within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that have been supporting uh, rural communities and have had a number of participations. So chart was just released uh, last month, and uh, there's a lot of interest on that. We'll see what happens with that. Similarly, the uh, maternal opioid misuse model uh, is one, and the integrated care for kids focusing on some of the challenges related to opioids and behavioral health, um, the new emergency treat, uh, triage, treat, and transport, and the primary cares initiative, as well as the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program, which has the opportunity to um, leverage a, a number of resources within the community. I highlight all of these because one of the challenges associated with some of the um, in innovations and opportunities is that, um, and we heard this in our, from our previous speakers, not all communities have necessarily the resources and wherewithal that are needed to be able to participate in this. Um, as we look at CHART, um, this is going to be a, a model that is going to fund only a certain number of communities. Um, there are other programs like the technical assistance offered through the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, but there also are a number of communities that really struggling to kind of pull together the resources. There's been research that has talked about sense of community and some of those communities that don't have that sense of community are less likely to be able to engage in some of the development of some of these programs. So as I think about um, one of the challenges associated with the, the place-based strategies and that consideration is um, this approach can leave some communities behind. And um, one just kind of looking and drilling down within that is this is the map of innovation that's kind of happening within Georgia and some of the healthcare facilities who are participating in uh, CMS models. And this could be any model, a model that is currently in existence or one that has already subsequently closed. And you can see where those areas are that are participating. And if you look at the catchment areas, uh, if you go to that map, you can look at the catchment areas that are covered by this there are large parts of the state that are not covered by innovation um, models. So how do we help to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to benefit um, and to maximize their ability to achieve their highest level of health um, and not necessarily have uh, a place where we could exacerbate some disparities by only supporting or working within certain communities? So I think building that capacity in some of the other communities that may be a little harder uh, is something that is important. And finally, um, as we kind of close out and thinking about what we need to do to achieve health equity, um, we really are at a moment in time in our country where a lot of people are talking about health equity. They're interested and we're seeing a number of resources that are being devoted to this. I think that there's um, a potential that we may actually not get significant progress. Um, there's, we need a lot more to um, get to where we need to be. Um, and chief among those is to talk about number five, which is really tackling those tough issues. Um, previous speakers have mentioned some of the structural um, racism and discrimination in our systems and some of those inherent inequities that are built in, thinking about how do we work towards tackling them. I think the other piece is making sure that we are sustaining a focus on health equity. Uh, these are not problems that arose overnight. Um, we've had over 400 years of inequities in our, health, in our country, and it's going to take us a while to address these. These are not things that we're going to be able 
to get rid of in 30, 60, 90 days, or even in a year. So having that focus, sustained focus, and engagement from leadership and the resources that are needed to um, continue the work. I think the other thing we, we talk about as well, we heard in the beginning of, of COVID, really the lack of data and the ability to monitor what's happening in our um, minority communities. This is not unique to minority communities. It's also something that's very similarly shared with our rural communities where not always do we have the data to be able to understand what's happening there. I think supporting our data infrastructure, analysis, and reporting um, to be able to um, not only identify where we have problems, but to be able to track and monitor progress, uh, working in state and local areas to increase and enhance that data capacity so that we can um, know what's going on and, and make sure. And then two other things I will kind of end with is making sure that we are building health equity into our standard operating procedures and making um, paths for sustainability. Uh, this really is something that everyone should be working on and we shouldn't have these special initiatives that we're thinking about, but really part of our standard operating procedures. So it's second nature. Reports that come out disaggregate data as much as possible. Um, programs look at what the impact of that is, apply that equity lens to programs and policies to develop them with considerations for how they may disproportionately impact certain communities at the beginning um, so that we can mitigate those impacts to the extent possible or um, provide additional supports where we cannot. And finally, developing a robust pipeline. And the increase that we've seen in attention on health equity has been great, but it's also been taxing um, for a number of folks who've been in this space because um, this has not been a, a well-funded and well-staffed area for a long time. So uh, those who've been here, I think, have even pulled in multiple directions, which is great, um, and also uh, something that we need. But as people are looking for diverse leadership across every sector, every level of our socioeconomic system, and thinking about how do we get diversity at the policy, at the public health, at the community, in um, all of the areas of clinical and others, uh, we need to increase the pipeline so that we have more uh, graduation uh, rates, higher graduation rates for communities of color to be able to be in a position to serve in these, uh, um, in these places. So with that, I know that was kind of quick, um, but I want to be respectful of people's time, but I want to thank you again for the opportunity um, and look forward to any uh, questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. James. Um, powerful presentation. So we've had a few questions that, that have came in that we would like to um, um, that would like to ask. Um, first question is: Are there particular states that have developed rural initiatives that have been effective? And what have these initiatives been able to accomplish? Yeah, so in terms of, I guess if the question is related to equity or others, I think that there's a lot of innovation that's been out in this space. If you look at some of the innovation models where we've had successes with rural participants in um, a number of those spaces, they have been able to do that. We've seen quality of care. Um, the rural ACOs who have been participating in those accountable care organizations have seen um, savings and improved health outcomes. So I think that there are a number of them working collectively and collaboratively, some of those in the um, towards the Midwest and uh, the Pacific Northwest. We also have um, people who are successfully implementing other models like the accountable care uh, organizations who are working in some rural areas and working on equity to link up uh, social determinants of health utilities, food insecurity to address some of those issues. And I think, um, you know, the other model that I would lift up that is a success and it's having some challenges, but it, it is one is obviously built off of the CC, uh, CDC's National Diabetes Prevention Program, but that Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program is effective in the communities that it has been able to be implemented and we need more um, of the providers to be participating in that so we can reach more of the rural communities and other communities of color who are disproportionately affected by diabetes. But those are a couple that I would, I would say. Okay. We got a, uh, we got a COVID-19 question and um, wanted to see if you could provide any comments or give your thoughts 
on the intersection of race, class, ethnicity, poverty, in the face of COVID-19, specifically, and health disparities in general. Yeah, so that's, that's a lot. I mean, I think that these, the intersections of every single one of those areas has played out in the um, unfortunate outcomes that we have seen. So we have seen the intersection of class and race as well as morality in terms of the um, workers who have been deemed essential and the lower wage workers who are still having to um, provide transportation if they work in transit or if they're in um, some of the food processing plants and some of those other places has led to them being at higher uh, risk for exposure um, as well as not having the resources and wherewithal to be able to um, take care of themselves and their families. I think the other thing that really um, weighs on my mind at this point when we look at the intersection of a number of those areas is we have just started a new school year or some people are going to be delayed started pretty soon. We have a, um, a, a huge, I have a huge concern in terms of what this means for those families. We already know in rural areas that broadband is an issue. We also know in families in which the parent has a high school education or less, they are significantly less likely to have broadband. So their ability to participate in virtual education um, is going to be limited. And even if you have broadband, um, for those of you who you know, have kids, you are working on things like technical uh, issues, uh, resolving those for the kids if those are happening during the class. If those parents are essential workers, is there someone there to help them resolve those issues or are they just disconnecting? Um, we also think about you know, whether or not the families have multiple laptops or computers and tablets or whatever the case may be if they have multiple children um, or if that parent is also working from home and doesn't have that computer. Um, so I think there is a potential that we will have huge um, disparities and I am really concerned about those students who may get um, disenchanted, uh, particularly those in the high school who do not graduate and just drop out. Um, so that is one way in which the intersection of all of this comes together and of course that has huge implications for their future earning potential, future jobs, future health outcomes. So um, I think we really need to focus a lot more attention on that and helping to lift that up as that will lead to better health as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. And again, thank you, Dr. James, for taking time out of a very busy schedule to join us today for, for our Public Health Ethics Forum. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, as we get ready to close out this year's Public Health Ethics Forum, on, on behalf of the Planning Committee, uh, I would like to thank everybody who has participated in the forum today. And to provide closing remarks, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Bring back Dr. Light Bird and also Dr. Warren for their closing remarks. Thank you, Craig. And um, today has just been really an extraordinary day um, for us for this um, public health ethics forum. And I noticed as I was observing the screen and listening to the presenters that we, we've had over 800 participants um, join us today for this critical examination of ethical dilemmas in rural health. And many of these dilemmas has, um, have been, has been repeated over and over are historical, they're structural, and they are complex. But there is a way forward as described by so many of our speakers. Um, to borrow from uh, Dr. Hall, there may not be cures as needed, but there are tools. So ultimately though, we seek solutions. Solutions that are ethical, that are equitable, and that are people-centered. There's much work still to do it goes without saying, and I appreciate and thank all of you for your contributions and your willingness to share your expertise and passion in replacing dilemmas 
with solutions. I also want to congratulate the students um, on their submissions and for all of their accomplishments um, to date. No matter how your poster fared, you have a bright and promising future. And we are all looking forward to how you will both shape and steer public health and ethics in the years ahead. And so I would just like to close by saying, let's all stay the course and let's all stay well. Thank you again for your time today. Dr. Warren. This has been an exciting day for me and a, a challenging day, both professionally and personally, as you all watched. I got blocked out a couple of times. And so I'm anxious to get all the details. Uh, we have an opportunity for that to happen. I want to uh, express my appreciation for the planning committee and the leadership uh, from CDC. Uh, in these times, there are so many things going on to stay focused on something that's important is not easy to do. Rural America is new to some, but old to others. And I think we've got to focus on what's happening in rural America as the rest of the country is focusing on what's happening in their part of the, of the country. We had a lot, we've got a lot of data. We've a lot of presentations, pounds of data. And I would leave you with the thought, not what do the data say, because we all can, can, can really read it, and do the kind of analysis that need to be done. But what do the data mean? In my view, that's the ethical question. Uh, that's the construct of ethics. That's the, the uh, context of ethics. And that's really the commitment to ethics. We're in transition to really look at the, the, the right part of doing what is public health. And that's sometimes in conflict with what we think we ought to be doing. This is an exciting time. And It looks like um, Dr. Warren has been victim to the technology again, um, and hopefully he'll be able to come back. But I'd just like to say certainly um, and share as he, as I know, is thanking everyone for all of your efforts today um, for acknowledging that, you know, the future that we can create for ourselves moving forward and the leadership and the perseverance that we're going to need in order to realize the kind of rural communities um, where we can see health equity and we can experience um, social justice in all of the other areas that were raised today. Captain Wilkins. Thank you, Lightbird, and thank you, Dr. Warren. We're sorry you had um, technical difficulties and had to, um, had to get off Again, um, on, again, on behalf of the Planning Committee, uh, we thank everybody for your partition, participation today um, and looking at these very vital and critical issues uh, in, in, in rural health. As Dr. Lightburn said, we wish everybody well and continue to be safe. Have a wonderful weekend. And thank you again for attending our 2020 Public Health Ethics Forum. Thank you.